Church, you have no idea what, how much this has impacted me, even studying these passages about heaven. It's, it's funny, when I set out to start a sermon series, uh, in large part, I, I follow the Spirit's leading and where He wants me to preach. But then also, I, I look at the church. I see, what do we need? What do we need to hear? What encouragement could we use? But honestly, as I have studied through this, I have been so impacted and so blessed myself. I sit in my office and I'll read these passages where Christ looks at his church and says, I want you home. I want you with me. He, he looked at his early disciples and he said, I, this world will be full of trouble, but take heart because I've overcome this world. I am so excited about this. In the series so far, we've explored two questions. Uh, why is heaven better? And then last week we talked about what will heaven look like? This morning I want to dive into scripture though and study and answer this question, what will we do in heaven? This is probably the most common question that I have ever been asked about heaven. What will we do there? And you know, this is probably what also kick-started this whole idea for this series. I heard this well-known Southern Baptist preacher speak, okay? And uh, I'm not going to say his name, but he, he's very well known. I've listened to him for a lot of years. And this is what he said about heaven. Forever and ever and ever, we will gather around God's throne and sing and worship 24-7. I listened to that and I thought, it, is, that, is that it? I mean, I felt bad. I felt bad asking these questions. And forgive me, but doesn't that sound a little boring? That we would just do one thing for all of eternity, one thing over and over. I even had a student one time come up to me and say, that heaven sounds so boring, I would rather be in hell. I just took a step back. I didn't want lightning bolts around me. Because here's the thing, though, church. We've done a disservice to this next generation when we present a heaven that is uninteresting. And unbiblical, because we're going to look in Scripture, that is not what we will be doing in heaven. And I look and I think, gosh, have we reduced the glory of God's promised kingdom to like an extended fifth Sunday sing? I, I look and I think, we, we need a better understanding of this. This church, the church in general, has a dim understanding of what heaven will be like. The Bible says in Matthew 13, 44, that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Do you get that? Heaven is treasure. It's promised treasure. It should produce joy in our hearts, not dread. Psalm 1611 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He looks at God, the psalmist looks at God and says, you are the fulfillment of all my joy. You're the bringer of all my pleasure. Does that sound boring to you? God never intended us to be bored of the thought of heaven or to wish for something else. That pastor I, I listened to said, the Bible is almost silent as it pertains to what we'll do in heaven. And that's a lie. The, the, the Bible is full of descriptions of what heaven will look like and what we will be doing there. If you look in your bulletins, I put a list in there of just the ones by myself that I was able to find. So I'm not going to touch on every single one of them, but look at that bulletin, look at that list, and, 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 and drive some wonder from it. Listen to this. Heaven will be better by far than anything we could ever hope or imagine. It will be completely satisfying, engaging, entertaining, fascinating, and wonderful. I'll tell you this. Jesus left this earth and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? He would not have spent all this time preparing a place that was boring or inadequate. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it is written, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I tell you, that verse gives me energy. And I am a ball of energy right now, so allow me uh, to, to expend some of that as I preach. C.S. Lewis said this, Your place in heaven will seem to be made for you and you alone because you were made for it. Made for it stitch by stitch as a glove is made for a hand. I love that description because here's the thing. We live on this earth, but we belong in heaven. That's where our home is. Our citizenship is there. Has anybody been watching the Olympics this week? A few people. It seems like that's all we've done this entire week. We've watched some sports that I have never heard of. And I'm like, how is this an Olympic sport? But it is, right? 
And everywhere you see in the Olympics, there's flags of all these nations. They're, they're printed on their jerseys, on caps, on billboards, on commercials. Sometimes it's really fun to figure out like, what countries these are. You see a flag and you're like, I've never heard of that country. In our house, and, and I think Chloe's back there, but in our house, it's really fun because when we see those stars and stripes, we cheer for America. And so we see Chloe and she, she'll get into it. We were watching ball, men's volleyball the other day. And she'll get up close to the TV and she'll say, come on, America, you can do it. <laughs> and so I love, I love seeing that, right? We cheer for, for our country, our stars and stripes. But listen to this, Christian, your flag is a heavenly flag. Your flag is pure white and it's adorned with the image of the Lamb of God who shed his blood to give you eternal life. And I love that. When, when I look at the American flag and I see our, our country win so many uh, gold medals in the Olympics, I cheer, but I think, this is my temporary home. This is where I spend, you know, God willing, 60, 70, 80 years, this is where I'll be. But my eternal home will be so much better. And I tell you, the Olympics there, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you there will be Olympics in heaven, right? And I, and I think they're going to be so much better. Don't get me wrong, okay? I'll, 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 preview, this, I'll preview this before we... Um, dive into scripture, we will worship Jesus in heaven, okay? Don't get me wrong, just because I said that's not what we will be doing 24-7. Revelation 22.3 says, his servants will worship him. So we know we will worship Christ in song, but that isn't all we'll do. And the thing is, he doesn't need us to sit around his throne and worship 24-7. It's not like, man, I could use some altos over here. This section of the choir is getting a little, getting a little thin. Why don't you come over here and, and join this section? He has millions of angels whose only purpose are to sit around his throne and worship. Look at this. Revelation 4.8 says, His angels day and night never cease to sing and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He has millions of angels to do that for him. Yes, we will worship, but we will do other things as well. Let me pray, calm myself, and then we'll get focused on Scripture this morning. Heavenly Father, I, I, am, I am overjoyed. I am abounding in joy this morning to be standing in this place, so privileged to be sharing your word. Lord, it's, it's a heavy and weighty responsibility. It is not something I take lightly. But Lord, I pray that I would share your word faithfully, that I would encourage your church, that I would uh, lift up your name and point people toward Jesus Christ because that's why we're here. It's the only thing that matters. Lord, thank you for promising us a home in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for looking at us in our distress and promising us a home of peace and of joy. I pray as we study scripture that our eyes would be open and that we would see your face. We love you, Lord, and we ask a blessing on the reading of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand to honor God's word? We're going to read in the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Sorry, I got a new Bible this week and I'm trying to figure it out. Matthew, chapter 22. We're going to read the first two verses. I, this is going to be strange, so you're going to have to stick with me, okay? I'll draw some parallels and we'll, and we'll go through this. But this is the best way I think we need to describe a picture of what we'll be doing in heaven. We're in Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to read the first two verses. I'm in the English Standard Version, the ESV, so it might differ slightly, um, but that is what the, the Bibles and the pews are. It says this, Matthew 22, 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. You can be seated. Did you catch that? The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. This is the way I'm going to describe heaven to us this morning because I believe that this is the picture that Christ desires us to see. Heaven is the final uniting of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Revelation 19.7 says this, Let us, whoa. <laughs> glory. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. This is, I think, the picture that Christ wants us to see of heaven, that it's the final uniting of the bride and groom. Last week, I had the awesome privilege and honor of uh, performing the wedding ceremony for, for Levi and Kayla Griggs over there. I'm so glad they're here today to hear all the things I'm going to say about them. I'm just kidding. I'm not. But aren't weddings the best? 
Aren't, aren't, they, aren't they awesome? Is it, nobody ever goes away. Well, I almost said nobody goes away crying at a wedding, but I think that's not true. Nobody ever goes away sad at a wedding. It's a happy place. This, this wedding that, that, I, that I performed it was, is in the mountains of Colorado. It's so beautiful. You can see the backdrop of the mountains behind us. There's water you know, softly rippling behind us. Uh, I got to walk up with uh, Levi. He was dressed in his best. He looked awesome. The bridesmaids and, and groomsmen entered, and they were smiling. Everybody's cheering. People are crying already. I'm like, oh, this is, this is going to be great, right? But then there's that moment when the music stops, and everybody turns, and the wedding march starts. Everybody stands, and the bride comes out. You know that, that moment, right? And she, she's beautiful. She's dressed in white. And now it's, it's kind of different now. Because uh, all the people hold up their cell phones. I thought that was, I'd never seen anything like that, like 200 cell phones all going up to take pictures. But all, all the focus is on that. She, she's smiling face, you know, like beaming ear to ear. And she goes up and she meets her room. It's, it's a lovely thought. It's a lovely moment to think about. And I think that's the picture that Christ wants us to see of when we get to heaven. It'll be us coming down the aisle to meet our room. Finally, after all this time, after all the, the, the things that we've suffered, after all the pain that we've endured, after all the problems we've faced, after all the, the, the ones that we've lost and had to mourn and bury, after all this, we get to look down that aisle and see our Savior. This is what I think Christ intended for us to see about heaven. But here's the thing. I challenged Kayla and Levi individually in the wedding. I, I said, Levi, you, you need to lead your family. You need to protect and respect and provide for your wife. You need to do the things that a husband is supposed to do. Right? And to, to Kayla, I said, you need to respect and honor and, and love and serve your husband. You need to do the things that, that brides are supposed to do. And so that's the first thing we'll do in heaven. And, and bear with me because I'm going to give you a picture of it. Right? Number one, we will have roles and responsibilities. We will have roles and responsibilities. I know that sounds really vague. Like, okay, but What? But bear with me, I'll give you more. Genesis chapter 2. Let's all go to Genesis chapter 2. At this point, God has created this world. It's perfect. It's spotless. It's untainted. It is wonderful and glorious. But there's nobody living there but animals. And so in verse 7 is where we'll start. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So see a picture of this, okay? God creates this perfect world. He makes this beautiful garden, and he puts man in the middle of it. I want you to see, this is a picture, the first picture we have in Scripture of heaven. Man being placed, not working his way there. He, he, didn't, he didn't gather up enough dust to form himself. God made him, formed him, and placed him in the garden. Now skip to verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Adam had a role and a responsibility. His role was to work, right? So we see Adam from day one, he's, he's created, and God's like, get to work. There's no laziness in, in, in the Garden of Eden, and there will be no laziness in heaven either. We will have productive labor, something to do, something to accomplish, work to be done. I know some of you are probably thinking, man, I work my whole life, and I get to heaven, and I've got to work, I can't rest. The difference for us, though, and the benefit for us is that the the curse of sin will be removed. And do you remember what part of the the curse of sin was? That man's work would be hard, and it would be sweaty, and it would be backbreaking, right? But in heaven, all those things will be removed, so our work will be, I'm not going to say easy, because I don't think he's just going to give it to us on a silver platter, but I think it will be It won't be hard work. It won't be toil. It won't be difficulty. It won't be back-breaking labor. We will never curse our employers behind their back, right? Have you ever ever been done for the day? You've got like 15 minutes left on the clock, and your boss comes and gives you another job, and you're like, 15 minutes, and I was going to be gone, right? And you've got to do it. Or if you work on a ranch, uh, like some of you all I know, you don't ever get a break. You just have to do it all the time, 24-7. But here's the thing. Our work in heaven won't be 
back-breaking labor. It'll be fulfilling to us. We'll wake up and say, I can't wait to get to work, right? Why? Because it's serving. It's serving God. We're there not, not to, he said, you're not there to, ser- to be served, but to serve, right? So we're going to be serving. Lord, we'll have a role. Adam's role was to work. What was his responsibility? It says in verse 15, his role was to work. His responsibility was to keep the garden. That word is really, really broad. It's a terrible job description. I'm not saying God made a bad choice. I think he made an intentional choice. But if you were given that job description, you would have a lot of work that needs to be done. Because that work, that word can mean to watch over, to take care of, to keep guard, to observe, to watch, to protect, to administer, to restrain wild animals, uh, to celebrate accomplishments, to preserve or tend flocks. This word goes on and on and on. There's like 150 definitions of it. So we don't know what Adam's actual job was. He could have been a zookeeper. He could have been a gardener. We don't know. Maybe somewhere in between. But he had roles and he had responsibilities. He did something. He got up every day. We know one thing that the Bible specifically says he did. And that was what? Does anybody remember? Jeopardy time. He named all the animals. The Bible says all the animals came to him and he gave them a name. That was one of his responsibilities. But he had roles and he had responsibilities. The same way in heaven, we will have those responsibilities. We're going to live in a physical place. Remember we talked about this last week. It will be a physical place with real things to do. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see a bunch of the the ones that I was able to find throughout scripture. And you can read uh, the verses on your own. Here's a couple of them. Judges. There will be judges. Rulers. Kings, administrators, scholars, farmers, fishermen, metal workers, landscapers, musicians. Those are just the ones I was able to find this week. That's not the, a comprehensive list. That's just a few I was able to find throughout the books of Isaiah and, and, and Job and a couple of other ones. You see that though? This world is not going to be boring. Heaven, heaven won't be boring for us. Maybe this is your opportunity to try something new. No limitations in heaven. Right? If you always wanted to do something, maybe this is your chance to do it. If you're like, man, I've ranched my whole life, or I've farmed, or I've kept livestock my whole life, please, Lord, don't make me do that again. Right? Uh, maybe the Lord will listen to you in that. But also, he may be like, you have all that experience. You're now in charge of all of my flocks on the, thousand, or on the 10,000 hills. Right? But we'll have things to do. And I'm going to pull it back to the idea of a marriage. Because in a marriage, we both have responsibilities. Right? Mindy and I have different roles and different responsibilities. But the purpose is that we serve each other and we give of ourselves toward each other. You know, one of the things Mindy does is laundry. And I don't mind doing it, but I just, I'm not, not good at it. I overflowed the, the washing machine last time I did laundry and it went everywhere. It was a terrible situation. But um, Mindy, she gives me clues sometimes. And uh, as a man, men, you know this, we don't, we don't do clues very well. We need direct, direct statements. So sometimes I hear Mindy say, man, I got a lot of laundry to get done today. And so sometimes my ears will per- uh, perk up and I'll say, oh, is, this, is this a clue? Is this, do, do I do this now? Is this, is this my, my thing to do now? Or uh, am I watching Chloe now? What, like, what is the, the thing here? But, but we have different roles and different responsibilities. I, I promised on our wedding day, May 19th, 2007, to love and serve and honor and pr- protect and provide for her. And, and, I, and I keep my roles with, with joy. Sometimes I don't um, have joy when I have to do laundry or wash dishes, right? But, but we serve each other. And that's the idea Christ wants us to have, right? In heaven, you'll have roles and responsibilities. You'll have something to do. You'll have labor with your hands. And the good thing is it says, uh, if you're a fisherman, it says you'll never put your nets down and they come up empty. Everything you do will be successful. It says if you, if you tend a, 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 a vineyard of grapes, it says that they will flourish under your hands. Isaiah says that if you keep livestock, they'll multiply under your care. Everything you do will be successful because everything will be in perfect in heaven. I, I love this idea that I'll never fail. That, that I will never uh, come up and say, man, I, I, I just messed that one up royally. Because the thing is, in heaven, we will have no limitations. Everything will be perfect. Uh, just a picture of what we'll do in heaven. Number two, and I think this is the most important one. We will learn and get to know Jesus. We will learn and get to know Jesus. Our jobs in heaven, our responsibilities, they'll be secondary to this calling, to get to know our Savior. Right now, our minds are affected by sin. We, we can't use all of our brains. Scientists say we use, what, like 
uh, of our brain capacity in heaven will be limitless. We'll be able to do the things that God designed us to do. We'll be free from sin. The Bible says we'll be transformed into the image of his son. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school this morning, but we will literally be new people. David Jeremiah says this, though. The transformation will not change who you are. It will make you even more yourself than you are now by removing all the flaws, weaknesses, and incapacities you inherited from the fall. One of the questions that I am asked frequently is, when you get to heaven, will you know everything? I do not believe that is the case. I don't believe that we'll get to heaven and all the questions we've ever had in our heads, we'll just know the answers to. I think it will be a process. And heaven knows we'll have time, right? We'll have time to discover these things. Uh, we learn more and more about our spouses every day, don't we? When Minnie and I got married, and she loves for me to tell this story, for the first four years of our marriage, um, Mindy made something with tuna in it every single week. Um, tuna helper, tuna salad, tuna something. And, and, and I did not have the heart to tell her that I hate tuna with a burning hatred. I hate it. It smells bad. It, it tastes bad. I just don't like it. But how can you tell your new bride that you don't like what she is fixing? So I ate it. And I, and I ate it with a smile on my lips. About four years into our marriage, she asked if I wanted any more, like a second helping. You know, I don't turn down a second helping food. And I hesitated for a second. And she looked and she said, do you not like tuna? And it's like everything she knew at that point about me was a lie. I'm being more dramatic than it was. But she realized in that case she learned something pretty significant about me. And I will say I have not had tuna since that day. It's been, it's been a great five more years of marriage. But I'm just kidding. No, it's been great. I'm just kidding about the tuna. But, um, but here's the thing is that, that I look and, and I think we, we learn things every single day. Sometimes she'll be talking. Well, the, the funniest is when she'll be praying with Chloe at night and I'll be sitting there and she'll say something. I'm like, I didn't know that. We learn things about each other every single day. And that's the glory of heaven is that we will spend all of eternity learning new things about our Savior. I love this. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? I love this. There is, there is no limits to him. We will spend every day spending time with him in his word and we'll stop and say, I've never heard that before. I had a, I had a, we're, we worked with a pastor named Larry Potts. And uh, he was a great, great, great man of God. He was the preacher that I, I studied under in, in my first church. And uh, he had told me from the time that he got married and then got saved, about 20 years old, till the time I met him at 63, that he had read through the Bible with his wife once a year, every single year. 43 times when I first met him that he had read through the entirety of Scripture. I was, I was blown away. I thought, I, I've never heard anybody able to read that many times. And he said, Mark, you know what I found is that every time I read it, I learn something new. Every time I read it, I see something I didn't see before. Every time I read it, I learn something about my Savior that I didn't know. So we'll spend all of eternity learning him and getting to know him. Colossians 2, 3 says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Ephesians 3, 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. All of time we will learn. I'm a learner. I, I love learning. I love reading. So this appeals to me. If you're like, man, I did so poorly in school. I scraped by, you know, with some, some D's and C's, right? But, but this, this is so different. This is so different. This won't be homework. This, this will be face-to-face -face encounter with our King and our Savior. It's like when you're first dating a person, don't you want to spend all your time with them? I remember originally when Mindy and I first started dating, we, we would talk on the phone all night long. Like all night long. We'd look and be like, it's four in the morning. 
How did this happen? How, where did the time go? And then later that day, we still got together and, and talked to each other again. Like we had more to talk about. We, we loved speaking to each other and getting to know each other. That's my favorite thing. After Chloe goes to bed each night, my favorite part of the day is just sitting with Mindy on the couch and talking. Right? We live not very exciting lives, but we do. We, we just talk. How's your day? What did you, what did you do today? Right? What did you go through today? And I think it's the same with Jesus in heaven. Lord, can I tell you about my day? Can I tell you what I did today? Can I tell you where I went today? Because there's no limits in this new earth, in this new heaven, and new earth, what we'll do and where we'll go. And you know what? Every single day, I don't think Jesus will ever get bored of it. He'll look and say, talk to me. What did you do today? Where did you go? What, what, what tasks did you accomplish? How did you serve me today? I'm so excited for that day. Paul wrote, one last thing I'll share and then we'll be done this morning. And I think this is the most real and raw thing that he wrote. It's in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. And he said, Now I see Jesus in a mirror dimly, but then I will see him face to face. Now I know him in part, but then I shall know him fully, even as he has fully known me. I love it. What will we do in heaven? You've got some specifics I put in your bulletin, but here's the big two. We'll have roles and responsibilities. And then number two, we will learn and get to know our Savior.